Welcome back to the Florida Linguistics Association Beginner's Guide to Phonetics. I'm Lee Ballard, a phonologist at the Florida Linguistics Association. We're going to continue to go through phonetics today and give you more information to help you understand languages besides English. This will help you do better on phonology problems and review for your exams. This Florida Linguistics Association intro guide is a multi-part mini-survey course. Last time we talked about consonants. I gave you examples of the most important consonants in English, how they vary from each other, and I showed you the phonetic symbols from the IPA used to represent them. Before that, we talked about English vowels. Today, it's on to part four, which deals with fun facts from other languages. Take a moment to review the most important English consonants. Take a moment to review the most important English vowels. Remember that a phonetic description of a consonant or vowel really describes articulatory gestures of human speech organs, which take place mostly in the mouth and involve articulators like the tongue, lips, and teeth. Today we're going to talk about Spanish, German, and Russian. What are some things for English speakers to keep in mind in order to have a good Spanish accent? Well, you're about to find out. Then we'll move on to German, which is famous for harsh-sounding consonants. I'll take you through the vowel system, show you some consonant patterns, and make some comments about how to avoid bias in linguistics. Finally, we'll listen to a little Russian. There's a lot of confusion out there about Russian vowels. I'll clear this up and show you how the vowel and consonant systems work together. You'll probably start to see why German and Russian can be pretty hard languages to learn. For Spanish, English speakers have to remember to take out glides that often occur as part of English vowels. If you pronounce the word too, you'll notice that the vowel ends with a kind of W. We want to eliminate this in Spanish. Also, the consonant in the English word too is pronounced strongly with a puff of air that accompanies the T. You can feel this if you put your hand or a piece of paper in front of your mouth and say two or T or key. This is called aspiration, and we want to eliminate this in Spanish too. So even though English and Spanish both have words that sound like two, in English it's two, and in Spanish it's tu. In English it's no, and in Spanish it's no. Spanish has five vowels and they're all tense. This is really different from English, where most of the vowels are lax. You can remember it pretty easily with the rhyme A, E, I, O, U, el burro sabe más que tú, which means A, E, I, O, U, donkeys know more than you. Now for some Spanish consonants. The word burro has a trilled R. You know this because it's spelled with a double R. The word rancho has a trilled R too. You know this because it's at the beginning of a syllable. Spanish also has a flapped or tapped R. We use this as a T in English in words like butter or piñata. In Spanish, the same sound is considered an R. In between vowels, you'll just have to memorize which R it is, tapped or trilled. Don't confuse them in words like perro, which means dog, and pero, which means butt. As in the conjunction, people, oh my gosh, get your mind out of the gutter. So, if you want to pronounce the word piñata in Spanish, you need to make three changes. The first consonant should be a plain P. The first vowel should be tense. And the final consonant should be a plain T, not a flap. Piñata. Now on to German. Earlier we talked about rounded vowels like U and O. In English, all rounded vowels are back vowels and vice versa. In German, there are also front rounded vowels. There are four of them, as in the words Für, Pünktlich, Schön, and Töpfer. Front rounded vowels in German are spelled with two dots. There's a lot of confusion about this. Some Americans think that these are diphthongs. They are not. Although we'll see later there can be one, there is not necessarily any other vowel that mixes in. Maybe people get confused because if letters with two dots are not available, you can spell them A-E, O-E, and U-E. But that's just spelling, not phonetics. Front rounded vowels correspond to the front vowels we know from English. Hooray! It's going to be easy! I'll pronounce unrounded, then rounded. Listen! E -e -e -e. U -e -e -e. German has two kinds of R's. Vocalic R at the ends of syllables and non-vocalic R at the beginning. Riesen means giant and Fötzen means 14. In Fötzen, at least in my non-native idiolect of German, the R creates a diphthong after the high, lax, unrounded vowel I. Fötzen. German also has some unusual consonants. A velar fricative H, a palatal fricative H, a voice velar fricative R, an alveolar affricate Ts, and a labial affricate P. Acht, which means eight, has a velar fricative, and ich, which means I, has a palatal fricative. So does bisschen, which means little or small bite. 
Like the two T's in T in Batman, the two fricatives in German are part of the same sound. It is pronounced velar after back vowels and palatal elsewhere, that is, after non back vowels and the beginning of a syllable. Some people mistakenly believe that the word ich is pronounced ich, but this is totally wrong. At least, it's not standard German. Before you judge this consonant too harshly, there is actually a palatal fricative in English too, like in the words human, huge, and hue. How about them apples? Even German G is sometimes pronounced this way, like in ruhig, which means quiet or peaceful. As far as affricates, zu means closed or tu, and pferd means horse. One of my biggest beefs in linguistics is when people use the word guttural to describe anything. That may have been okay in the 19th century, before people really knew anything about phonetics, but now it just makes you sound ignorant. So say the German has velar fricatives or dorsal continuance, but anything besides guttural. A good rule to remember is not better, not worse, just different. For unfamiliar language phenomena, instead of judging something, just say that it's different from English. Here's the IPA for German vowels. There are a couple more rounded vowels added, and we had to take away the vowel A ah, as well as add in a long and short ah. If it's hard to read, you could draw it this way. Here's the chart again. Notice that, besides the low vowel ah, all tense vowels are long, and all long vowels are tense. Exactly how this works is a question for phonology. I'll read the chart for you going down the columns for front, central, and back, unrounded, followed by rounded. E, U, E, 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 a, 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 o, 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 o. Now let's move on to Russian. Russian vowels are a lot simpler than German. Just like Spanish, there are five. E, a, u are tense, while e, a are lax. Because of the Russian consonant system, there are ten letters that represent five vowels. Pronounced alone, the letters sound like e, u, a, ya, u. U, e, ye, o, yo. In Russian, most consonants are either palatalized or non palatalized. If you want to know a secret, though, most non palatalized consonants are really velarized. Just like rounding the lips in English for u to distinguish it from the other high vowel e, palatization and velarization in Russian is really about accentuating that contrast. Let's just avoid the controversy here and call consonants palatalized and non-palatalized. The palate is an important thing today, isn't it? Not only do we have words like German ruhig, but now we've got all this stuff in Russian. Here are some examples. Mat means checkmate or cussing. Mat means mother. Mama also means mother. In checkmate, the M and T are non-palatalized. In mother, the M is non-palatalized and the T is palatalized. In mama, both M's are non-palatalized. Mat, much, mama. In myasa, the M is palatalized and the S is non-palatalized. So far, it's just been one non-palatalized consonant maximum on either side of the vowel A. Ah. But watch what happens when both sides are palatalized. In the word for wrinkle, mech, the vowel is pronounced higher. Let's look at another example, polka and polka. Polka means shelf. The L is velarized, like in the English word ball. It's not ball with a plain L, but ball with a velarized one. Same for Russian polka. Polka, though, means Polish woman. The L is non-velarized, a palatal liquid, or possibly, depending on who you ask, a palatalized lateral liquid. Wow! Now look at the word tiotia. Both T's are palatalized. The mid vowel O which is almost always lax in Russian, between two palatalized consonants is pronounced tense. Wow. Let me underline the palatalized consonants with two lines and the non-palatalized ones with one line. Check this out. Mat, mach, mama, miasa, but mech. Polka, polka, but tjotja. Pretty cool, huh? This is the end of part four. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check out parts 1, 2, and 3, as well as other videos on our channel and, of course, our website, www.floridalinguistics.com. This has been Lee Ballard for the Florida Linguistics Association, and hope to see you again soon.